Good afternoon, guys and gals. Welcome back to theCUBE, the leader in live tech coverage. But you know that because you've been with us for over a decade, right? I won't even say since the last segment. Lisa Martin here with John Furrier. We have an 11 time alumni back on the program, Vaughn Stewart. Vaughn, this is your 11th time that we know of. Yeah, that we can count. That we can count. <laughs> it's in the database. It's far as, I, as the archive goes. <laughs> and as I do, I stalk people on LinkedIn, and I see that you've recently achieved vast data, vastronaut status. Congratulations. Thank what you does so that much. mean? And do you have a onesie like the suit? I hope. Um, I have a onesie, but it's different than a suit. Uh. Uh, but I need, yeah, I need my astronaut, uh, <laughs> my astronaut kit. Uh, look, I'm, I'm incredibly honored and privileged to have joined Vast. Uh, Jeff and Renan and I had been doing the recruiting dance for, for a little while, and you know, look, I had a great run at NetApp, right? The, the, the vendor that, they didn't invent NAS, but they became the NAS leader, changed the market dynamic, had a very extensible platform. Very fortunate to join Pure at a very early stage as well. Um, they revolutionized, again, not the first all flash vendor, but yep. they revolutionized what it meant to be successful as a flash vendor. Yep. And if you'd asked me a couple years back, what's next? I would have said, anything but storage. Yep. And then Renan and Jeff were like, what do you think of Vast? I'm like, I think your architecture is really neat, but I'm done with storage. And they're like, let us tell you about where we're going. Hey, we're not storage, but yeah. we're kind of storage. Yeah. Let me tell you about where we're going and it just like lit up all the synapses yeah. and I'm like, okay, I need to get there. I mean, they have a go big or go home message uh, for sure, you know, referencing the whole Silicon Valley, you know, got to go big um, or go home, fail or, or go, just knock out of the park. It's looking really good. We had the launch event in our uh, Silicon Valley offices to Cube, and what got my attention is they're kind of not a storage company, but they're kind of a storage company. Because they're kind of got a, a new way to think about the data tsunami that's coming, or here. And by the way, if you look at cybersecurity and any vertical, the data's going up exponentially, but budgets aren't, right? right. So, so you have a practitioner gridlock problem, skills gap problem. Yep. This is actually the reality of the current situation, never mind the go reinvent our infrastructure right. for AI. Right. Those three things are huge current situation dynamics. And people are kind of up to their eyeballs with like, oh my God, what do I do next? So no one's really kind of doing anything. There's no real global GSI out there saying, here's how you move all your data to AI. Here's how you completely transform. So I, th I find it very interesting that that's in the center of this, this disruption. Um, what's the playbook? I mean, what do, you do, what do you guys advise customers? Are they ready to move? Is your product fit for this new use case? Right. Take us through the, the value proposition. Right, so, were you going to say something? No. Okay. Uh, so let me, let me, for your audience, I'll just set the stage real briefly. So, so Renan and, and, our, and our founders set out to address a challenge that's been in our industry regardless of disk or flash or sand or NAS, doesn't matter who the vendor is. And it was this, this trade-off that you had which was, I can make highly performant storage or I can make low cost, large scale, you know, storage capacity. But you can't have both. Do you want deep and cheap, or do you want highly performant? And the whole industry was trained around this model, right? I'm going to put my most recent data in the high performance, and I'm going to let it age out. And so we made all these tiers, if you will. And the problem with tiers is once you start shuffling data around, the ability to get back to that data is very difficult. Yeah. They really looked, they, they had a, a really good vision about looking up and saying, is AI a standalone process or does really the notion of AI or maybe more importantly accelerated computing, whether it's mm -hmm. GPU, TPU, IPU, is this the next wave of the future? And that's kind of where I think we're very different than the storage industry and why we're a, more a data platform than a storage array. Because what we believe is that you're going to have accelerated computing all throughout your infrastructure and much like the, what VMware, when they ushered in the cloud wave, we're at the, 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 the beginning of this need for customers to go in and make their infrastructure GPU capable or AI capable, and it's not a silo. Yeah. And I have, I have all kinds of stories to share with you around whether we're going to talk about HPC, whether we want to talk about large language models, whether we want to talk about GPU accelerated tools in the enterprise, and so, where do you want to start? Well, on GPU accelerated tools, that's like a current state-of-the-art process that all enterprises have been adopting. NVIDIA's been doing great. 
Crypto's kind of one of those use cases, but that's kind of lost favor. In comes AI, that kind of brings NVIDIA to a whole nother level, right. so you got acceleration, which is its own category. Yep. AI's booming, so everyone's just hoarding the GPUs. <laughs> that's the story here. There, there's a supply chain issue, for sure. Um, it, and what's really incredible for the size of the company that we are, right, we're just shy of 700 people. We, we are the storage platform for the, the major GPU cloud providers, right? CoreWeave, which is, which is NVIDIA's first and only elite GPU cloud partner. Core42, which was formerly G42. Lambda, and there's more, we're just not ready to share that with you And with, Lambda's with new, you isn't yet. it? That, wasn't that only announced last month? Relative recent announcement. Yeah. Lambda Labs, Paper Space. Don't know about paper space. Yeah, they're in Maybe that. Breaking news they're for in me. the Nvidia DGX kind of well, what's really, circles. What's really interesting there is all of those clouds started like a, a, like an HPC environment would be. They went and they bought a parallel file system, right? We're we're bringing in the GPUs. We're bringing in all the, the the software that's that's GPU optimized. Obviously, we need high performance. So you go to HPC storage, yeah, yeah. parallel file systems. Kind of where GPUs were first consumed at scale. You know, compute grids, Linux grids. And what they found was it, the HPC, or the parallel file systems that use an HPC can feed a GPU, but they're boutique and they're fragile so they're not online all the time. And particularly being in the service provider space, right, right like parallel file systems are great if you can tune for the workload. You can't do that, by definition of cloud, you can't do that. Is Cloud it, is, you have to support whatever's coming in and it's unknown. You mentioned okay. CoreWeave, CoreWeave's focus. They're basically an AI, um, primary GPU-based virtual machines. Yeah. Okay, NVIDIA DGX enables that. And we've been kind of having a chat on theCUBE and riffing up, David Vellante and I have been riffing on this uh, on our CUBE research team. Remember the old white box days in the 90s? Yeah. You're starting to see these tier two clouds emerge. So that they're not saying I'm a tier two storage. They're saying I'm tier two cloud. They're not, mm -hmm. we're saying they're tier two. We say super cloud tier two. But it's almost like Amazon's got all these assets. And you've got these now new environments emerging from the semiconductors, mm -hmm. enabling a new bare metal like environment to be purpose built or specialty based. Mm -hmm. This is a whole new wave coming. Do you agree with this? It's a whole new wave. And if you look at, just look at like Lambda. Right, the, the number of research institutions that are their customers, whether you want bare metal or, or virtual machines, so you can do dedicated or, or shared infrastructure, and their costs are significantly lower than the hyperscalers. And look, we, we've got partnerships with, with all of these vendors and, 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 and engineering efforts that are in tow with all of them, but uh, they've found their niche, uh, which is to, to go and address this market in, a, I think, a more agile and more affordable model. Now let's see how that scales over time. Stand up pretty quick. So you're selling storage to them, you, or you're the storage provider for them? We're selling a data platform Data platform, okay, that's good. <laughs> I want to understand, you know, given the hype cycle of AI, and we've seen this massive uh, acceleration in the last year. Yeah. It was Dave Vellante always jokes that AI was born in November of 2022. <laughs> but obviously with ChatGPT and the rise of that, everyone's talking about it. How does vast data help customers get ready for the AI revolution? So it goes from the hype cycle to really making business impact. That's a really good question, and I think it allows me to actually to kind of go back to a point where I talked about these clouds started with like HPC storage and then didn't meet their needs or their, their infrastructure. And so we're at this chasm, if you will. You can, it, the lines are clear, right? Customers need large storage capacity so they've got an economic element to it. They need HPC performance to feed GPUs. If you can make performance equal to HPC, now the requirements change. Mm. And now customers say, I want enterprise grade resiliency. I want secure multi-tenancy. I want data encryption. Right? I want quality of service. I want a global namespace. I want to be able to burst into the cloud. This is all the, the fundamental kind of first chapter, if you will, of vast data about what we've, we've brought to market. And I kind of shared with you earlier, I said like in the last 10 years, right, the storage industry's been focused on adopting flash. What's happened in a, in an adjacency is you've seen all these data platforms pop up, yeah. right? Uh, Kafka, 
right? So it's got stream processing going on. Uh, as volumes of data sets have come, they need to be enriched with metadata tags, and so these start to become databases that sit around the storage array. And so we're just listening yeah. to our customers who have the largest data and the most demanding needs, and they're saying, I'd like a table. Yeah. I'd like everything in the data, in the, on the data platform indexed. Yeah. I'd like it to be available via SQL queries so I can process this data faster and I don't have siloed uh, infrastructure. And as we announced at Build Beyond, right, we've got, we've got um, triggers and functions coming. Yeah. And so I go back to, yeah. this is what innovation looks like. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There isn't a storage array that does any of this. So yeah. that's why we're trying to define a new category here around a data platform. I think that you're right about the HPC kind of angle here because yesterday at the Dell community event they, they co-located at the Sheridan, the tax CEO said AI vindicates the HPC way. Mm -hmm. Meaning, in other words, everything that they've been thinking about what they stand for has been kind of validated, takes it on another level, but also gives them more paths to commercialization, mm -hmm. not just research and doing the long game. Okay, so that's, I believe that to be true. Then the next question is, okay, what's going to happen next? And we've been saying on theCUBE oh, this year, at least I can't remember how many times we've been on theCUBE together saying this, that there's going to be a radical um, disruption around data management. Yeah. Uh, if you look at how things were done in the old way, or the, the way that's going to be soon to be old way, to the breaking, bringing in the AI way, it's changing significantly. You can't do governance the old way in silos. You got to build governance in from day one. You got to have data addressability. Yeah. You need speed, low latency, multiple database formats. So the idea of how you make storage decisions goes away. So I buy that argument that compute platform is coming, hence the AI vindication. Every major market shift in our industry has fundamentally been fueled by taking something that has a lot of steps collapsing them, making it simpler, because the, when you can simplify it, then it allows the adoption to scale. Yep. And so if, you, if you're, again, if you're thinking about, we tend to have two mindsets that we, when we talk to folks who are acquiring GPUs. They either think it's a silo, or there's those who have a three and a five year perspective and go, mm -hmm. actually my whole infrastructure needs to be AI or GPU enabled. And we're in that latter camp. Yep. And so with most of our, most of our uh, deployments, it actually starts very siloed. Yep. But what separates us from the parallel file system folks is the customers understand, yep. I don't want to be shuffling data back and forth, let's say between my digital assets and some, some uh, uh, accelerated computing tools. I want the accelerated computing tools to read from the source yep. because that reduces time, increases efficiency, reduces my cost. And so I think we're going to see this transition yeah. and, and we're, we're a leader in the data platform space to make that possible. Yeah, and the, the other thing that came out of the HPC community meeting was the, what, the optimization question. Do you optimize for more compute, GPUs, TPUs, more, and more cubes, PUs, only whatever processing units you have, or networking? And so this, this is an open question of, as you start thinking about the modern infrastructure, you, you got They want the exaflops. They want the performance. Yeah. What else can we get? Right. So that's an open question. What do you optimize for? Yeah. If you have a data platform, what happens next? Is it you want low latency? Most of the people in the cloud I talk to, the hyperscalers, they're like, we kind of figure out the processing game. We got to figure out the interconnects and the networking. That's a big part of the story here. What's your uh, reaction to that? Do you agree? And how do you look at customers who have to figure out? how to knob up and turn the knobs and, and, and get optimized on. So, you bring up the network being a bottleneck. And, and we see that, right? Whether it's network speeds or the, the PCI buses or the systems that are connected to them. Mm -hmm. So the GPUs can overrun a lot of the interconnects today. Mm -hmm. um, and so we have to work with customers through power considerations, fabric considerations, uh, but when you kind of boil it back, and I'll, I'll come back to kind of HPC because yeah. we're at supercomputing, yeah. even that market's changed, right? HPC used to be performance at any cost. Uh, you know, we got to install clients and you'd build out a grid yeah. and that grid would, would age, right? You'd let, you'd let Linux servers get five, six, seven years old. Cybersecurity comes in now, right? You get a security patch, you got to go do a kernel update on the grid. I got to go update 2,000 clients. I got to go update the driver for HPC and it's, an, it's introducing more downtime. And so yeah. now we talk to the research centers, they're saying, they're telling us in droves, it used to be performance at all costs, but I have downtime. 
Now to attract a researcher or a research team, mm. they want more parallelization, mm. they want to research more, right? I, I need to be online, I need to be able to do it in parallel. And again, this is where the, the market is shifting to what we're doing. And again, don't take my word for it, talk to TAC. Yeah, TAC's right? awesome. TAC, TAC, uh, TAC hosts the Lustre user group, and now yeah. they're a vast customer. The, one of the former founders of Luster is the CTO at Doug. Doug's been a multi-year customer of ours. Yeah. Founder of BGFS works for us. So you're seeing a slow realization yeah. in that industry of, I may be comfortable with managing parallel file systems because my team's done it for 20 years. I moved to Vast and I don't have to take the, any of those out just because we don't have those maintenance constructs. Yeah. So it's a paradigm shift. So, it sounds to me like Vast Data is a, is, a, is a rocket ship. I mean, you are a Vastronaut. We, we I am a Vastronaut. I, I certified <laughs> Vastronaut. In your opinion, as the VP of Systems Engineering for Vast Data, what's the secret sauce? What was it? You kind of alluded to this in the beginning about you, you know, from a career perspective, and you're like, no sure. more storage. But you saw something there. What was that secret sauce that you're taking on the rocket? When you, when you can see where the market is going, uh, and refer referencing back to, I'm a firm believer that accelerated computing will be the norm in every data center, whether you're on-prem, in the cloud, the hybrid. So when you can see where that's going and you can see where there's, there's a, a seismic delta between yeah. HPC systems that are fast, but boutique and fragile, enterprise storage, which is robust and available and online, but not performant enough to meet the needs of accelerated computing, and you sit down with, a, with a, you know, the founders of a company who are like, we've identified this. First is to solve the performance cost scale challenge. Next is to go and start to fold in all these data services, data processing platforms to give a, a, a more richer set of leveraging your data, reducing time windows, reducing moving data around, reducing cost. Um, when you have that capability, you can become a strategic partner mm. to clouds yep. to industries, you become a strategic component yep. within their product, so product process and development chain. That's what's really interesting to me. You, know the, you know, the thing about um, storage and networking and servers, now accelerated computing that you're referring to, there's architectural decisions, you got to make trade-offs. Yep. Uh, one concept that's been um, here in theCUBE this week at, H, uh, here at Supercomputing is uh, disaggregation, memory disaggregation, yep. uh, fabrics are back, uh, interconnects Ethernet. I mean, we, we, I was talking to someone at, uh, at Broadcom, and they're talking about 400. <laughs> okay, all right. So, okay, Ethernet's getting faster. So, you, it's a systems architecture mindset going on right now. So, disaggregation and di silicon diversity is a big topic. What's your? What, how does that connect the dots for this new environment we're moving into? You know, I'm not sure we set that question in, but I love having this conversation. <laughs> so. What do they say in our industry, right? There's nothing new, right? There's just a new version of it. So back in the 60s, you had compute rooms and memory rooms and storage rooms where everything was you know, disaggregated. Yeah. Yeah. And so now that we've got fast interconnects with low latency and, and high bandwidth, there's this notion now, do we disaggregate the compute layer? And as you take the next step and say, okay, well, how do I disaggregate to a storage layer or a data platform layer? I would challenge you to find any vendor that's here that's in a better position to leverage the disaggregation mm. than vast data because we are disaggregated yeah. by nature. Our architecture is comprised of compute nodes mm. that run, that are stateless, that run containers, which are our points of protocol yeah. access, connected over our low latency, high speed fabric mm -hmm. to JBOFs, right? There's no intelligence in our storage and controllers. Mm -hmm. And so, we are a precursor to, John, I think what you're alluding to here. Yeah. And I think you'll see more from us in the not too distant future yeah. that's going to continue to further disaggregate this architecture. Well, it, it's an ecosystem uh, boom because what's happening is now you have this new enablement and what we're seeing here is almost like a commercial ecosystem booming. Yeah. And the new functionality, Lisa, we've seen this movie before, VMware yep. ecosystem. Yep. You know that ecosystem well. I, I might have done a little bit. I might have done <laughs> a little bit in that, that space. Bit. You know, open source is booming <laughs> right now. Open source is hot as, as could be. Um, AI obviously has got kind of a systems aspect to it that people are trying to figure out at large scale, but certainly the, the training stuff's key. At, at KubeCon last week, um, Lisa, we heard this phrase from a Google engineer, Tim Hawken, Cube alumni. He said, quote, Inference, inference is the new web app. Yeah. Okay. 
implying that that's where the value extraction is. Mm -hmm. So cost side training, train the, with the GPUs, throw everything at it. Inference is what happens with the data. This is why the data architecture is going to be hugely important. What's your reaction to that? Uh, I agree. Um, if, you look at, if you look at everything that we're building in the data platform, uh, sure, there's cost benefits. It's really about time optimization. Um, wall clock time. Uh, so for example, if you look at like our Trino pushdown, right? I can put Trino on an all-flash array that gets 400 you know, microseconds of latency. Yeah. I, or I can put it with the push down and talk, talk to the vast database mm -hmm. where we're able to, to actually break apart the parquet file and instead on a query return yeah. parquet files, just return the data that was being searched for. And as a result, why we are an order magnitude slower than say an all flash block array, our results are 20 times faster. Parquet is going to be the going to change the entire data game. You watch, parquet will absolutely democratize um, data lakes. It's going to destroy. It's already happening. It's going to destroy the HDF, advantage. H, all, the, all of our poor customers that have lived with HDFS or it's the, yeah. the subsequent Kudu and all, all of this noise, it's all just being wiped out by, mm. by S3 and Parquet files. Okay. And again, okay. skate to where the park, open park source, is. Open source, baby, open source. <laughs> <laughs> My last question yeah. for Yvonne is our, in our last minute here. You've been there a, a short time, but you've obviously saw a lot there. You, you described the rocket ship, the secret sauce, the differentiators. What's your favorite customer story that you really think shines a light on some significant business outcomes that Vast Data's data platform is enabling customers to achieve? <laughs> I'm sure there's many. There's a lot. Um, I've been blown away. The scale and the size of the customers that I've, the scale and size of the deployments and how customers are using our technology across life sciences, media and entertainment, research, it's, it's all been just a whirlwind that, <laughs> you know, it just, it, it, you know, it fires a lot of endorphins. Uh, I think right now it's the customers that have, uh, Again, some customers are like, AI is a silo. Maybe, yeah. maybe if I'm doing a large language model, I'm doing a training, I want to have a better chat, chat bot. Okay, it's, maybe it's a silo today. It's the, the, what really moves me is, is the customers that are, are able to actually say, my mindset is to bring the GPUs to the data, yes. not bring the data to the GPUs. And by what I mean by yeah. that is an AI-enabled infrastructure versus, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. am I just doing a, a modern version of ETL? I'm going to, you know, mm. I'm going to bring my whatever, my okay. lifecycle data into my uh, in my AI silo process and put the data back. That that feels like a very technical well, now, move. Now the, now the conversation: bring your workload to the data, not just the GPU. Bring the entire workload over. Yeah, whole other ball game. So, obviously, the, the data grab is <laughs> big. But uh, what really kind of blew me away, and, and so uh, kind of going back to customers. Yeah, I didn't know that that I was skeptical that customers would want to put their key assets in the cloud for lots of reasons. IP leakage, yep. data sovereignty, compliance and yep. regulatory reasons. Yep. Uh, then now that we've got our, our hybrid capability, it, it, so we've got a global namespace that'll span across multiple sites, but now also into the cloud, and you can replicate your data if you need to, but what's been really interesting is the number of customers that are like, look, I just want a cache view of my data from the cloud, because the cloud has tools that I don't have. Ah. And I want to run those tools on my data set, but I don't want to move my data, because yeah. yeah. egress charges means I'll never be able to get it back. <laughs> right, right. But I want to make it accessible, make my data accessible to these tools, and maybe it's a tool today on cloud A, and tomorrow on cloud B. We'll and see. so this, this notion that I think the industry's fought with around like, you know, how do you make data universal, mm. and not yeah. get bound to all the constructs that, you know, Look, the secret sauce about any compute platform is data is what holds you to the compute. Yeah. <laughs> and so we're, we're breaking some awesome. of that as well. I love that, making you. data universal. Yeah. Vaughn, thank you so much for joining us on your 11th episode that we know of on theCUBE. Congrats on what you're doing uh, with, with Fast Data as VP of Systems yeah. Engineering. As always, we will I, be I appreciate keeping it. our eyes on this space. Yeah, cool. Always a pleasure. Thank you, Lisa, thank you, John. For Vaughn Stewart and John Furrier, I'm Lisa Martin. You're watching theCUBE's live coverage of SC23 from Mile High City, Denver, Colorado. Stick around, John and Savannah are up with our next guest.